In the last video, I mentioned that there are two de details about Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction that I need to um, talk about. Now let me start with this idea of flux linkage. Suppose that I have a loop here. That's the loop of my loop of copper wire. And suppose that I have a magnetic field going through it. So let's say I have a uniform field with the flux density B. And that's the the area of this loop is A. Um, so, if I think of the magnetic flux as V times A, then we know, we understand that um, from Faraday's law, that the voltage induced is equal to the rate of change of phi. So um, it would be say the change of phi over the time taken. So that's for this law. Um, now, what if, what if I have not just one loop, but I have another one? Okay, let's say um, I have another loop behind this one. So this loop goes this way, it goes one round, and then it goes another round. So I have two loops joined to each other, okay, uh, very, very closely. So this means that the, the magnetic flux is actually, the, the um, magnetic field is actually going through both loops together. And each loop has the same magnetic flux going through it. So in this case, would the voltage still be the same? Would the induced voltage still be the same? Actually, no. The induced voltage would be the same for each loop. But because we now have two loops, the induced voltage would be doubled. If you think about the induced voltage as, like, say, voltage in a battery, so then each loop would be like a battery. Okay, and now that we have two loops connected in series, it's like having two batteries connected in series. So it's only reasonable to expect that the, the induced voltage would be doubled. So this means that we need to modify our understanding of um, of the uh, let's see of, of, of Faraday's of my description of Faraday's law uh, in the last video. Instead of saying um, the change of the flux, okay, which is B times A, if I have what if I have two loops or more, let's say I have actually um, let's say I have N, okay, let's say N write this down. Let's say N is equal to the number of loops and it's going to the number of loops now the flux the flux is is just b times a flux density times area 
But if I have n loops, like for example in this case n is 2, but it can be 3 or 10 or 100. So if I have n loops instead, then instead of just saying, uh, just using the change of phi, right, just the change of flux in, in, this, in this formula, I should really find the change of n times of the flux. Or I can just take the change of flux, but and then I times n of them. So I can do it either way. So it should really be n times the change of flux. Now this this uh, n times the flux, the number of loops, the number of turns times the flux has a name. It is called and finally, it is called the flux linkage. Okay, so now we are ready to um, write down Faraday's law more clearly. So Faraday's law Faraday's law says that the induced voltage is equal to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage okay now there is another way to say this we can also say uh the induced voltage uh, in a coil is equal to the rate of change of magnetic flux. Instead of flux linkage, you can say um, magnetic flux linking the coil. Okay, so that's another way we can describe Faraday's law. Now, the next detail that I want to talk about, the next detail that I want to talk about, has to do with the the fact that what uh, that uh, the the magnetic field going through the loop might not be uniform. Now, this is not so much a part. This is not so much a uh, um, something that we need to change about the, the statement of Faraday's law. It's it's more about how we how we can think about or maybe even calculate the flux when we need to use Faraday's law. So Faraday's law, as I've written it, is should now uh, be complete. Right? We can think of this as, as the final version of the Faraday's law. But it's just that when we use it, um, there is a problem that we must uh, think about, which is what happens if the magnetic flux density is not uniform, and what happens if if it is not at right angles to the area. Now, apart from assuming that the, the magnetic flux density was um, uniform, same strength, same direction over the area, I actually made another assumption okay, that I did not mention, which is that the field lines are at right angles to the area. I kind of drew it this way, but I did not say that uh, uh, explicitly. So let me start from that. What happens if the field lines are not, um, you know, at right angles to the to the loop? How do we? Can we still use this formula? Okay. So let me start with this this little detail. So. I'll just draw a single loop again. Um, and this time, this time, suppose that my magnetic field goes through the loop at some angle, not 90 degrees. Okay. So this is my area A. 
flux density B. Question is, is the flux still equal to B times A? Now, it is it can it should not be equal to B times A. Now the to see why it should not be equal to B times A, let me start let me do take a, a slight uh, let me digress a little bit by looking at an extreme case. Then we will appreciate why why we really need to change that formula. Now Imagine what happens if the magnetic field is actually going in this direction. Okay, if the magnetic field direction is actually parallel to the area, then in this case, you can see that none of the field lines actually go through the loop. None of the few lines actually go through the loop. So as far as the loop is concerned, no magnetic field goes through it. All right, so in this extreme case, you can think that the flux that goes through the loop is actually zero because no, no magnetic field actually flows through the loop. Okay, so in this case, actually, the flux is zero. So that, that seems reasonable, right? So therefore, if the magnetic field is actually at an angle, we would expect that the formula should change. Now how should it change? The way to do it is this. If we go back to this first original example, where the, the, the field lines are, are perpendicular to the area, we know that we can just, uh, well, I've, I've said that we can just multiply the, the flux density and the area. But if the field lines if the few lines are at an angle, then the correct way to do this, the correct way to do this is to is to multiply uh, is to instead of taking the, the the flux density b directly, we should take its components which is perpendicular to perpendicular to the area. So let's say this is the component. Let's say this is the component. So this is the component that's perpendicular to the area. So if I imagine that a dotted line, let's say this is, this dotted line is, lies on the area, then this this is a direction that's at 90 degrees to the angle, right? We, in physics, we say that it, it is normal to the area. Normal means 90 degrees. We want the components of the B in this direction. Now let's say this angle here, this angle here is uh, 30 degrees, right? The angle between the perpendicular direction and the magnetic field, let's say it's 30 degrees. The magnetic field itself is B. So in order to find this component, we can use trigonometry. Okay. We would drop a perpendicular from the field to this uh, perpendicular direction like this so that we have a right angle triangle down here and once you do that you can see that this longer side of, of the right angle triangle this longer side is B and this side which is next to the 30 degrees is the component that we want and because this side is adjacent to the 30, 30 degrees it means that we, we should use cosine to find this component okay so this tells us that this component, this component here, must be B times cosine 30 degrees. So in other words, to find the correct flux density, we must take B times cosine 30 degrees. We must find this component first, and then multiply this component by the area. So therefore, instead of taking the flux as just B times A, we should take it as B times cosine 30 degrees times A meaning that we should add a cosine 30 degrees down here. And we can, we can make this more general. We can make this more general uh, just by saying that, right, if it is instead of 30 degrees, let's say it is 
theta. Then the, the formula should be phi equals to ba times cosine theta. So now we get a formula that we can use even if even if the magnetic flux density, the magnet, even if the magnetic field is not actually at 90 degrees to the area. And then um, finally, the part about the uniform magnetic field, uh, non-uniform magnetic field. What if the, the magnetic field is, um, is uh, a bit stronger here and a bit weaker there and it sort of goes in different directions? And what then would be the, 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 how then should we calculate the flux density? Now, in that case, things get a little bit more complicated. So I, I won't do more than give a very brief description of what we need to do. Um, so if um, we imagine, say, in, in this case, I'll just draw a bigger loop. Suppose that we have a magnetic uh, field that is not uniform, so some goes straight, some goes there, and it spreads out like that. Okay, so as it spreads out, the magnetic field gets weaker. So this means that down here, the strength of the field would be weaker than here. For example, down here it will be stronger. So the field here is not only weaker, it is also at a different direction from here. Now we have already seen just now how to, to deal with it uh, if the, the magnetic field is at some other angle. We just multiply by cosine of that angle. So we know how to deal with this part. But what if some part has one direction, some part has another direction? Now the way to deal with this is, is that we would divide this we would divide this up into many, many small areas. You can imagine dividing this up into many, many small squares. Like many, many small areas. So in each area, in each area, the magnetic uh, flux density will be roughly uniform over that small area. So we can find the flux, magnetic flux, by using this formula, okay, for that little square. And then we can do it for another square and another square where, where the directions are, are different from that one. But within that square, um, the, the, the flux density and direction would roughly be the same. So we, we do it for each and every square, and then we add up, add them all up to get, to get the total magnetic flux going through this loop. So this will work even if uh, the, the flux density is not uniform across the area.